I don't even have to say anything, everyone's gone quiet. <laughs> well trained. It's starting. <laughs> Let us stand and worship. God, it is hallelujah for all you've done. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made for us. And thank you for loving us and calling us your children. Amen.
Please be seated. Welcome. For those of you that uh, don't know me, I'm uh, Chris Rowney, the team leader here, and it's lovely to see you and hopefully to be seen by you, whether you're sitting in the seats here or joining us online. Um, if you are new with us and you want to uh, learn more or have us learn more about you, there's some little forms with some information that you can give us about yourself and if you want to sign up you can uh, end up with our sort of e-news which will let you know things that are on. Another way of finding out things that are on is the notice board that's down the back and there's uh, you know, a fortnightly men's coffee, a fortnightly women's coffee, there's a few other events and um, I didn't look at all of last week's service yet so I'm not sure you probably were told that next Sunday afternoon there's another opportunity for you to uh, bless the Buchanans. So um, if you uh, keep an eye on the email, I'll send that information out as well. I did watch, there were some wonderful times of hearing from them and praying for them um, last week. Also, I don't know whether you have been inviting. Remember I said it takes you know, a certain time to get into a habit of uh, inviting people around and um, you know, being hospitable as we're urged to in the Bible. So hopefully, if you still remember your blue sheet or if you weren't here when I preached on that, there's still some of those up there with some good prayers for uh, you know, praying about uh, you know, being inviting, both in the sense of being attractive, inviting, you know, it looks really inviting to go over there, but also in the actual um, act of inviting others to be involved and join with us, if you remember the VIP, VIP treatment, visiting, valuing, inviting, involving, and praying and providing, all things that each of us are to do. And uh, part of that is to care for those that are um, part of our congregation, whether they're here or not, who face challenges and who are unwell. And there's a few different people that um, we know, I won't uh, name them, but um, you will know some and others that are uh, um, part of our congregation but haven't been able to join us for a long time, others that are with us that have heard news and I'd like you to join me as I pray for them now. Dear God, we place all of our worries and cares in your hands. Father, your only son took upon himself the sufferings and weaknesses of the whole human race as he walked amongst us. He healed with his words and his touch. And through his passion and cross, he taught us how good can even be brought out of suffering. Lord, we pray that you would look upon our sisters and brothers who are ill, facing chronic um, conditions, facing new conditions, those who have a diagnosis, those who suffer with no real idea yet of the cause. We remember them in a special way and ask that they would know today your words of life and your touch of love. We place our sick and our needy under your care. And Lord, we ask that you would restore them to health again and that above all you would grant each of us the grace to abide in you, to know and make known your love for all of us. Amen. Um, one of the other people who you see around here from time to time is Josh. I'm going to invite Josh to come up. Um, Liz might come up and join him for a minute as well. I don't know if they're coming with some kids as well. They have the most delightful kids. Lots of fun. <laughs> anyway, I, I just want to as well spend a moment just to talk about something that's still a very long way off. The middle of next year, in fact. Um, that's part of our ministry to the wider church and our calling as a church to love our neighbour. Um, some of you, maybe most of you, but maybe most of you is too many, I don't know, some of you at least now probably know that Liz has started, just started working on a PhD. What you might not know is that Liz was sort of headhunted in a way, approached to do that by a professor at La Trobe University with the offer of a scholarship to research the way faith communities can best partner with other groups and organisations to you know, bring health, physical health, mental health, spiritual health to people that are in need. And that's a great recognition of Liz's skills and her pastoral heart. And it's based on her previous academic record, her studies and her character. And it's pretty good news for us and for the wider church to have someone who's able to research that and know those things. And part of that scholarship is that from the middle of 2023 next year, We'll be giving Josh 12 months study leave, even though Liz will be the one studying, because some of the research is to be based out of Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. So in 12 months from now, in about June next year, the Butros family will be winging their way to England, and the bad news is that we will miss them. 
The good news is that they'll be back in the middle of 2024. <laughs> if you want to know more, have a chat with them when they've got some free time. And pray for us as a leadership as we um, find the right people who are gifted and available to take on some of the sort of uh, some interim paid roles to fill the gap while Josh is away. We would intend to start those sort of study leave interims at the beginning of 2023 to allow some overlap and continuity of ministry. There's a wise leader who I knew many years ago who used to say that we should always be willing to give our best away in blessing others. And the funny thing was I actually had a conversation about that with somebody about half an hour before Josh and Liz came to tell me about this and I thought, oh, okay, God, I've got to live what I believe here. I haven't told them that before. Uh, a wise leader, we should always be willing to give our best away in blessing and pray that God will bless us as we do. And this is an opportunity to put that into practice, even if we aren't so much giving them away as just lending them for, you know, a while. And we might have to charge overdue fees if they don't um, get you back in time. So anyway, uh, yeah, Josh, and you can let him know whether there's kids ministry as well. How's that? <laughs> yeah, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, a couple of things. I think there's not too much to add that I wouldn't probably enjoy chatting with you all about in person, Liz and I. Um, it, uh, I think, you know, it's it, in one sense it's been really incredible to see that um, as this kind of, you know, came up really out of the blue. A, a number, it was a com culmination of a lot of miracles over about a decade, I reckon, at least, of different, different bits and pieces. Um, and it's certainly not the timing, I think, that we would have ever expected and things like that. Um, but, like I said, the culmination of miracles and, and seeing God at work in this situation and the timing um, has been a great comfort to us. And what, what's a bit of it, I mean, it's a challenge, more for you than for me, but um, a big challenge. Uh, and I wanted to say uh, that we've really been aided in, in the context of this by the support that we've had so constantly from, you know, the family here at Warrigal and the, the support and the encouragement, um, you know, for Liz, I and the family um, consistently through. Um, and also, I think for the leadership who were very insightful and wise in the way that they engage with this. And then seeing them recognise God's fingerprints on the way this was shaping up um, and their hearts see God's will done, I think has been also an enormous encouragement as well. So we're very, very grateful, um, mildly daunted, but very grateful. And we're looking forward to sharing some of those kind of stories as well. So is that everything? Did you have anything you want to say? Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That's exciting news, isn't it? Our Winston will be sorry. <laughs> okay, let us stand and continue our worship this morning. Let's sing about how God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son.
his communion this morning. The ordinary things. What is the opposite of ordinary? What's the opposite to ordinary soap? How about perfumed soap? An ordinary car. A luxury car. Meat and potatoes. What about enjoying a sumptuous meal or a banquet? Jesus used ordinary things in his stories when he was teaching the disciples or a crowd. Let's think of some. Only 99. Where is the other sheep? A lady is sweeping and looking everywhere for her lost coin. The father who was longingly looking for his son to return home. As well, Jesus chose ordinary things to represent his body and blood, which we use at communion. Bread is the basic food of many countries and their cultures. For example, naan bread, chapatis, and papadangs might be used in India. There are many kinds of bread in our shops. White bread, high fibre, wholemeal, seven seeds, sourdough, olive loaf, and many more. Some of these have their origins in other cultures too. The fruit of the vine, which we have as grape juice, can be fermented to make wine. Our brothers and sisters in the Catholic, Lutheran and Anglican traditions use this. Bread to eat and drink made from grapes are ordinary things. Why did Jesus choose these ordinary items for us to use in remembering him? Well, bread and drink sustain our bodies. God is not only the author of life, our uncreated creator, but also our sustainer. He sustains us not only physically, but also spiritually with his word and his Holy Spirit. When we consume these tokens of our usual meals, it reminds us to remember. Whether it be breakfast, roast lamb with friends for a weekend lunch, or sardines on toast for Sunday tea, we can use these ordinary things to remind us about our wonderful saviour who has not only saved us, but sustains us every day in every way. Let us pray together. Loving Lord Jesus, we thank you that these ordinary things which we are about to have remind us of your special love shown on the cross. May the meals we have every day remind us of how you sustain us. Amen. Everyone who loves Jesus or would like to learn to follow him is welcome to share in this communion. There are two serving tables where you can collect your cups. The gluten-free wafer is in the bottom one. Please leave your cups beside the chair leg when you're finished.
Father, we do thank you for your giving heart and that you invite us to join you in giving, not because you desire to get from us, but you desire to give through us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have here today and giving in other ways, that which we acknowledge we have only because of your grace. We ask that it would be used to buy way more than its dollar value in lives that are changed and touched both here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. And part of our giving always goes to support work in other parts of the world. And each week we hear and pray for one of those. And we're going to do that now. I can see you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This morning we're praying for the Bangladesh Community Sustainability Program. The program aims to meet the needs of minority communities in the Bandaban Hills region, focusing on improving access to quality education, sanita sanitisation and livelihood opportunities. Support through global mission partners will enable lives to be changed. Today we'll focus on what is happening in the area of education. There are currently two hostels which continue to improve access to education for over 80 students from some of the poorest, least developed and politically marginalised groups in Bangladesh. Currently management and income support of these hostels have been built up to the point of covering their costs. The project will help strengthen management and income of these student hostels. The program will also support teachers in remote communities, a new activity attempting to bridge the gap between local and regional education opportunities. So let's just take a moment to pray for this sustainability program in Bangladesh. Father, we commit the programs in Bangladesh to you we give thanks for the work of global mission partners in Bangladesh and in other parts of the world. Father, we pray with faith that the young people currently learning in these hostels will prove to be a catalyst for change and they will be inspired and, to, and strengthened as they learn. We also pray for those who are caring for and teaching these young people for continued strength and blessings as they seek to nurture these young people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise.
I'm not one of those pastors who generally, you know, wants to contact the worship people and say, this is the theme and you've got to pick songs about that, partly because I've been a worship leader myself and sometimes it's really difficult to pick songs on the theme or, you know, the themes always often, often the same. And I just figure I always will just trust God and, um, you know, God's way bigger than my sermon or my message anyway. It's not as if this is the only thing that's important about God. But I like it when God um, brings things together. There's a couple of ways in which he's done that today. But we've just sung a song. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And I want to talk uh, a little bit today and next week as well um, about, um, about this, this, this word and, and, and taking it you know, from perhaps being this strange word that we you know, use in different ways um, into something that we can take into all of our lives. I mean, there's two words used in the Bible, you know, uh, Kodesh in the Old Testament and Hagios in the New Testament, and they both actually mean other than or apart. Um, you know, we can have strange ideas. And the thing about holy is that, um, you know, it, it's used in the Bible a lot. In just in the New Testament, it's used 215 times. And you might think that's an awful lot of times, but um, depending on your age, you might be familiar with a, another medium that used holy even more than the New Testament. And here you go. Holy smoke! Holy showcase! Holy haberdashery! Holy popcorn! Holy Kofax! Holy jack-in-the-box! Holy ravioli! Holy safari! Holy iceberg! Holy blizzard! Holy snowball! Holy Sherlock Holmes! Holy Venezuela, you're right! Holy rainbow! Holy hole in a donut! Holy backfire! Holy hallelujah! We holy graveyard, Batman! Holy crossfire! Holy hole in the donut? <laughs> I could go on. It goes on for about eight minutes. Um, if you like, we can watch the rest of that instead of my sermon. But no, we won't do that. But, you know, <laughs> yes, holy, used in all sorts of ways. And, and, you know, it gets used lightly often. It's, it's become a word that gets stuck in front of all sorts of things, especially if you are Batman's sidekick, you know. <laughs> but when we don't use it lightly... We often almost use holy too heavily, perhaps. We think holy just means, you know, good, pure or sinless, or maybe it's just to do with God, or it's an adjective that, you know, we put in front of certain things that mean they have to be treated in very different ways. You know, you can't, you know, treat the Bible like any other book. You know, I bend the corner of my pages when I read a book. If I did that to my holy Bible, people might be very um, concerned and so on. But um, at its heart, as I said, it really just means um, set apart, other than. Um, and the interesting thing is that it sort of changed in the way I think God saw it used amongst his people and how he intends for us to, to use it even now. Because in the Old Testament, there are an awful lot of places and things that are listed as holy. Holy because of their association with the worship and remembrance of God. And here's just a few, you know, the holy land in Psalm 78, the holy mountain, God's holy hill, the holy city, Jerusalem, the holy ark, the holy altar, the holy garments, and the holy utensils. And no, I don't think that's a colander. It's something quite different that we used in the worship of God. But you know, the interesting thing is in the New Testament, it's not used like that. There aren't all these things and places that are called holy in the New Testament. It's quite different. Instead, we find things like this. It does talk about a holy temple, but it's not one that you could pinpoint on, on Google Earth. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Or we might find this. It talks of, I want people everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer and greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, um, in the New Testament... The interesting thing is that it's not so much that there are uh, things and places that are called holy, as there are holy people doing holy things. You know, there are other world religions that have places that they consider holy. 
so holy that part of their religion is to take a pilgrimage to that place because it is holier than any other place. Some people today who are Christians consider certain places more holy than others, whether it's Israel or Jerusalem. Perhaps some people might think that way about, you know, the Vatican or, or places like Lourdes that they would go to for a pilgrimage for, you know, it's, it's holier. But I don't see it like that. There are some places that are wonderful to visit because they make history come to life or they give you an experience that enriches your faith, but they're no more holy than any other anymore. Because in the events of the you know, first Easter, when the banner, the curtain, the veil in the temple was torn in two, there was no longer barrier between us and the holy place. It was holy because it was set apart. But that set-apartness has been now dealt with in a very different way. So does that just mean that everything is the same as everything else? Well, well, no. And as I said, I love that God works things out. And I'd thought of doing you know, this message, and, and next week I'm going to talk about baptism, um, as you know, the, these special things that we do. And I thought about that before Robin... Um, told me what she was doing for her talk in her introduction to communion, in which she talked all about the ordinary. Because, you know, we call this holy communion, but it's not special bread. It's not juice from some sacred vineyard or bread from some anointed bakery. And we in our church tradition, at least, don't have to treat it with the same fear and trembling that some others do, that, you know, if we spilt some on the carpet, it would be a, a, a dreadful sin. But it is also more than just being ordinary. It's just bread. It's just juice. But besides that ordinary, it's extra ordinary. And it's so like God that the ordinary isn't removed or replaced. It's not that we have to get rid of that and we have to import special wine from grapes grown on the Mount of Olives and bread that's been, you know, baked from grain that was, you know, threshed where Gideon, you know, was on the threshing floor. All oh, those great places in the Bible to make it holier. It's just ordinary. Hate to burst your bubble, we just get the juice from Woolies and Coles. And the crackers are a bit more special now because they're, they're little and they're gluten-free and they fit in the bottom of the thing. So, you know, we, we go to some trouble to get those. But, but only for that reason, not because they are somehow, you know, their communion holy crackers. It's the ordinary. Not removed or replaced. But it becomes extraordinary. In a way, it's transformed as we use it. Through its association with the divine, it might seem a stretch for us, but that's not, you know, entirely unfamiliar that that would be the case. We're used to taking ordinary things like eggs and flour and butter and making it into a cake. And it might be an ordinary cake or it might be a very extraordinary cake, a special birthday cake or a wedding cake. And it takes on an extra dimension of meaning. We might have some paper and some ink and it's just paper and ink. But if it's a diploma, a contract, an award. It's more than just these ordinary things. It takes on some extraordinary meaning. And, and a kiss, if you think about it, it's just two bits of facial tissue coming into contact. But between lovers, it means so much more. And it's the same with this simple meal that, that we in this church do each week. These simple things that we share each Sunday, bread and juice, 
I think I said this back when we were going through Mark's Gospel and we got to the Lord's Supper. You know, wrapped in glad wrap with a straw in a plastic box, it's a child's lunch for school. Wrapped in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, placed in the context of his love towards us, held in our hands as we turn our attention towards him, they work to bring present to us the gift of his grace. And it's not that we in this church think or teach that the bread changes and is transformed in some magical or mystical way, and therefore we have to treat it because it's somehow more holy. It, it remains completely ordinary. But it is still transformed in a way. As I said, we don't, you know, have to come quietly, solemnly and reverently because we don't want to spill any of it and that would be terrible. We might come quietly, sovereignly and reverently. But not for that reason. For the same reason I'm um, always wanting to help people understand what I think it understand, what it means when it talks about, you know, examining yourself and don't receive it unworthily. Because I've heard it said almost that, well, you know, you've got to examine yourself and see if you're worthy. And if, you're, if you've got some sin, well, well, you know, you shouldn't be coming and we should stop people with sins from coming. And I always think that's bizarre. Because what is it that deals with sin? Well, it's Jesus' death on the cross. What's communion? It's the remembrance of Jesus' death on the cross. So what's going to deal with your sin to make you... Oh, hang on. It's, it's this. I think when it talks about coming unworthily, it's when you come and you don't recognise its worth to actually deal with your sin. You're ashamed to come because you think you're so sinful that Jesus can't deal with it and wash it away. This is the table not for those who've judged themselves worthy to come. It's for those who actually examine themselves and know they are unworthy and without it never will be and then do come. Which leads me to say that it's not just something we do. It's not just part of our church tradition, a ritual for the sake of it. It is very ordinary, but it is also very extra ordinary. It is set apart. It's holy communion because we take the ordinary and it's set apart at this time for something separate, something different. It's a sign, it's a symbol and you know people get worried about talking about those sometimes or it's somehow less real. No, you know, a sign or a symbol points to a reality. It's an image with a particular meaning that points to the reality. But you know, our weekly communion is a whole lot more than just a sign or a symbol. Because it's not just something that we see as we drive down the road and see signs or, or hear about as we might hear some you know, announcement or something like that and we hear a sound that symbolizes that you know, the microwave's finished. Far more than being just a, a sign or a symbol. It becomes a very real presence for us of God's grace. And so in some churches, it is talked about as holy communion, and they might even refer to it as a sacrament, which might sound mystical and magical, but, but it is. But you know, what is a sacrament? As I said, I think you know, um, signs point to something. Symbols can be signs that more than just point to something have uh, an extra, um, you know, meaning added to it. But, you know, the sacrament becomes even more than that because it's an experience that we have. And so rather than just a sign or a symbol, it's an experience that we participate in each week. It's, it's, a, it's a visible form of invisible grace, some have said. It's perceptible to our senses. We do this. You know, if it's just the ordinary, then you're just taking some bread, eating it, and taking some wine and drinking it. When we understand the, the holiness of it, the sacramental part of it, we take some bread and in it we become aware of the mystery of the atoning death of Christ. We take the wine and in it we become aware 
of the worth and the power of his blood to save. It's more than just a symbol, it's a sacrament, it's holy in that sense, because we participate in it. We don't just look and learn. And it's not so much the bread and the cup as it is the actions that accompany them. Because we have to participate in the actions. The bread and the cup can be there on their own. They could be here with nobody here. But that's meaningless. Unless we are here and we participate and we partake and we share together in this. As I said, communion doesn't exist separate from the people of God. We take part. Remember, you know, in the Old Testament, they might have had the holy mountain, the holy hill, the holy altar. And if there were no people for thousands of miles, you might still say they were the holy mountain, the holy altar, the holy hill. In the New Testament, the only holy is the holy priesthood, the holy nation, the holy people. Holy because we are indwelt by the holy, holy, holy that we sung about. And so we participate, we take part. And you know, it wasn't always that way. Many centuries ago, because of the way they ended up over-revering these things in the um, Catholic Church, they, they didn't offer the cup to the people because they didn't want it to be spilt because of how they understood it. So for centuries, they withheld the cup and they only had the bread. And that only changed, you know, not, you know, in, in the history of the church in recent times. If we read in the New Testament about, you know, this experience that we share, I perceive from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When we do this, we remember and we proclaim, we show forth, we demonstrate, because we have done this. Our involvement in communion is a way of declaring that we recognize our need for Jesus as the bread of life. And our belief that he is the source of life, of hope, and of comfort. As we do this, all at the manner represented to the people as they escaped Egypt, food to keep them alive, we now believe is true of Jesus. He is our source of life. We eat ordinary food that keeps our bodies functioning, but we feed on this extraordinary food as a reminder to us, as a, a, a desire to participate in the experience of Jesus turning our existence into abundant life. All that was true of the blood shed by the priests as they sacrificed animals at the temple, we believe now is true of Jesus in the new covenant, the better covenant. His blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You know, I began today talking about holy, what was regarded as holy and what perhaps is regarded as holy. And, you know, in one sense, the ordinary remains ordinary. But that doesn't mean everything is only ordinary. Hopefully talking about the way the bread and the juice in communion goes beyond the ordinary to be the extraordinary, the presence and participation in God's grace reminds us that while we don't travel on a pilgrimage to a particular holy place, we don't dress up in special holy garments or wash in a particular holy river, that doesn't mean that the ordinary is all there is. So if we don't leave the common to visit the holy, how do we make the holy part of our common everyday life? Well, in a way, we don't. We need to learn that in one sense, we actually don't any longer have a common everyday life. But that all of life is now holy. 
When Jesus died, the thick curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple and the rest of the world was torn in two. Not that there was no longer any holy place, but now all places were ones from which you could approach the holy God. It's not that there is now no holy priesthood apart from the rest of the people, but that as believers we are now all that holy priesthood. Entrusted with the duty and the role of worshipping God, bringing his message and love to the world. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do, for it's written, be holy because I am holy. We're called to be a holy nation, being built into a holy temple of God, set apart, not so much because we have moved from the ordinary to the holy, but because the holy has invaded our ordinary existence. What once were holy places and things have not become ordinary, but the ordinary is now indwelt by the holy. As I'm really excited that you know, John said last week, it's like, yes, it's not just me saying it. People are getting this. I felt, you know, to sum up, my years, however long they're going to be here, is not to have you make church the most important thing in your life. Not even to have you make God the most important thing in your life, but to have you find God in all the important things of your life because he's already there. And that makes them all pretty important. Don't save devotion and God for Sunday, for church, for special times or places. Take it into all you do and all you are. Just as the common and the ordinary, we, we recognise differently when we're aware of the way God uses it. All the other ordinary things in your life may take on that extra dimension when you're aware of how God can, is, and wants to use it. As followers of Christ, as God's new creation, as his new possession, he's placed this holiness within us. So now the temple of God isn't a mountain in the Middle East. The temple of God's walking down the streets of Warrigal and Druin every day in you and in me. The question is, are we letting it leak through? <laughs> are we letting what once was commonplace and ordinary take on the holy nature that now it has because it's lived in the power and presence of the Spirit of God among us? I want to talk next week about how God takes something else very ordinary, some water. We've all had showers, we've all had baths, we've been swimming. Yet God takes that ordinary and makes that extraordinary as well. In one of those other things that we call a sacrament, as we talk about baptism. So if you've never you know, really thought about that, then um, you know, come next week. And if you can't come next week, try and, and listen to that message as well. And see what God might speak to us about that. But let me pray. And don't ever, you know, have to think, well, I've got to go now and start being, being more holy because I'm now doing the holy thing. Start realising that the holy thing is in all that you are doing. God is there in all that you do. Yes, perhaps in a way he's, he's there in an extra special sense as we come and we, we share communion and as we come and we partake of, of baptism that's not just like any other meal or, or any other bath that we have. But they're not things that we then leave and go back to an ordinary that's only ordinary. We're a holy people not because we're better than, because we're purer than. We're holy because we've been set apart. Set apart for his purposes. Let me pray. Father, we do thank you for all that you've done. That you didn't choose to look upon us as, as flawed and, and replace us. 
You looked upon us as love and you renewed us. And in so doing, you stepped into this world. And so the holy now is not just the heavenly. The holy is here because you are here. Lord, help us to look and find those things and those people that you want us to touch as you have touched us, that their ordinary would become extraordinary. Not just a sign that they would see and hear about, but a sacrament, a vehicle of your grace that they would experience and know. And may it be true for all of us, as Paul said, your grace is sufficient for us. In Jesus' name, amen.